Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live. As usual, please put in the chat that you're here so I know you're live. I'm doing solo, so it's even worse when I'm solo and I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I don't like that feeling at the first 60 seconds of a Facebook Live where I'm here all by my lonesome and I don't know anybody's listening and I don't know anybody's here, so I'm just talking to myself <laughs> in front of a screen, which feels very weird. So if you are out there in Cyberland and Facebook world in my public Facebook page, please give a shout out and say hello. We always have some faithful people who do that with me. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> Woo! I appreciate you for saying hello. So today we have a very important topic that we're going to cover. And I just want you to remember that this is my public Facebook page because we want to make sure that you're really safe if you happen to ask a question or you happen to say something. I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions, but let me just give you some background. So today's topic is why you should say no more to marriage counseling, why you should say no more to marriage counseling. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you're on the feed from all over the U.S. and some, some of you from the world. So I really appreciate you showing up and getting some information <clears throat> that can be really life-saving and life-changing for you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been in marriage counseling? And if that's true, how many of you have been in it more than once? <laughs> and how many of you have been in it more than twice and three times with no real success? with no real changes. Just put in the chat 10 times, three times, five times, you know, 25 times. I've worked with women for 35 years now in counseling. Now I've switched to coaching because I moved to Arizona. But in counseling, I did marriage counseling. I did marriage counseling for 35 years. And I have made all the mistakes that I'm going to talk about here today to not really help people. And when I started really researching this and writing books about this, I realized that marriage counseling is a wonderful thing. Please don't misunderstand that marriage counseling is a bad thing, but it's not helpful in these instances. So three times, three times, two times, twice with different husbands. All right. And was it helpful? Was it helpful? And sometimes it can be a little helpful, but not in destructive relationships. So I'm going to give you three main times that you should say no to any more marriage counseling if that is put on the table for you by your pastor, by your husband. Okay, I'll go to counseling with you, right? After all this, after all the mess that he's created, okay, I'll finally go because you're about ready to walk out the door. And then he'll go. You say no. You say no. And let me just say it really clearly. <clears throat> First reason, when there is chronic addictions of any kind, chronic deceptions of any kind and chronic abuse of any kind. This is not a marriage problem. It causes marriage problems, right? So you don't have safety in order to do marriage counseling. So if there is abuse of any kind, addictions of any kind, and deceptions of any kind, which includes adultery deceptions, okay, and sexual addictions. All right, if you have those three things going on in your marriage, marriage counseling isn't the first treatment option that's important for you to take. It's sort of like termites are not a house problem. Termites cause a house problem, right? Black mold is not a house problem. Black mold causes house problems. Abuse, chronic addictions, chronic adultery, chronic deception is not a marriage problem. It causes marriage problems, right? It causes marriage problems. So if you have termites in your house and you've got all kinds of rotting foundational wood because of the termites, yes, you have to fix the foundational wood for sure. But which comes first, getting rid of the termites or fixing the foundational wood? So if you fix the foundational wood, and the termites are still there, guess what? It's coming back. If you take care of the black mold problem by you know, painting your house or whatever you think is gonna fix it, but you don't really get at the, the problem, guess what? It's coming back. So chronic addictions, chronic deceptions, chronic abuse of any kind, that power over you, is not a marriage problem. It's a personal sin and character issue in your husband or in the wife, if it's the wife who is the abuser. But my audience is mainly women who are in destructive marriages. And so if this is your husband's problem, marriage counseling won't solve his problem. He has to own his problem, 
right? So when you agree to marriage counseling, you're saying this is our problem. Now, repairing your marriage is our problem if it gets to that. But you can't get to that if you don't get rid of the termites first. You can't get to that if you don't take care of the black mold. You can't take care of repair or restoration unless you get rid of the damage. And it's not just the other woman or the computer. It's what's going on in here and what's going on in here. And we're going to talk a lot about this at our webinar next week on Tuesday. We're doing a live webinar on how long should I keep trying and how will I know that this isn't working or the change is real. And so I'm giving you some of this right now. I'm talking about this in the webinar. I don't have time to talk about all this. That's why we're doing all these lives for you. If you haven't signed up for the webinar yet, please do so. You can do that at leslievernick.com forward slash join workshop. But it's so important that you understand, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a drink. That you have a chronic personal sin issue that's causing damage to your marriage, right? A personal chronic sin issue. It's an attitude of entitlement. I feel entitled to act out when I'm upset, whether I act out with my addictions or whether I act out with adultery or whether I act out with abuse, I feel entitled to do that even if it hurts you. That is not a marriage problem. That is not a marriage problem. That is a personal sin issue. If he is not willing to work on that, all the marriage counseling in the world will not put your marriage back together in a safe place. It might look better for a while, but the termites are coming back. You can fix all the foundational wood. And if the termites are there, they're going to eat right through it again. And now you're in the same place you've been. I've been here, been there, been there done that. See the same signs again and again and again. And these are why we talk, talk about patterns. We're not talk, talking about a one-time incident. We're talking about patterns. And if these are your patterns, the first reason you don't say yes to marriage counseling is here's what you can say instead. I understand I'm really glad that you want to get some help. But as I've come to understand this problem that we have of broken trust, I don't trust you anymore. I don't want to live with you anymore. I don't feel safe with you anymore. The problem that we have isn't fixed by marriage counseling until you fix why you break trust all the time. So you have to go to counseling first because we can't fix we until you fix you, because I'm not willing to go through this again. No more marriage counseling if this is your pattern. But let me give you a couple other things that happen because sometimes, you, you know, the abuse issue, the, the chronic lying and chronic uh, adultery and chronic uh, deception is a little clearer that this is definitely his problem. But the abuse issue, especially when it's more, more covert, more subtle, and we're going to be talking about those later on this week. What are some of the subtle signs of abuse, right? When it's a little bit more subtle, a little bit more hidden, it's not as easy to define as abusive because it's more underground. Then it's easier to slip into, well, maybe marriage counseling would help. Maybe the marriage counselor could see his abusive tactics. Maybe, maybe that will help. And so I'll, I'll, we'll try this. And you've done that and it doesn't work because... Second reason, <clears throat> you cannot speak honestly in front of the counselor. Or if it's a lot of little coverty things, when you start speaking up about it, it makes you look like a whining, complaining, ungrateful woman, right? He does this, he does this, he says this, he says that, he doesn't follow through on this, he doesn't follow. And all of a sudden it sounds like, oh, you'd be horrible to live with, right? And so it just looks like you're the problem. But when you go into marriage counseling, I'll never forget a phone call I got one time <coughs> when she said, she wasn't my client, but she said, you know, I've been going to marriage counseling for over a year now. My husband's a policeman and I just can't tell them what's going on. I'm not safe. I can't be honest. And if you can't be honest and you can't lay your cards on the table before the marriage counselor, they can't help you any more than if you go to the doctor and you can't be honest that, you know, I'm taking drugs or, you know, I've got a problem, sexually transmitted disease. I'm embarrassed. It's shameful, but I've got to be honest. If you can't be honest with what's really going on in the marriage counseling because you're afraid of the car drive home, because your husband's going to be mad at you that you told something that he didn't want you to tell, why are you wasting your money? It's like going to the doctor and not telling them what's wrong. So if there's ever a safety issue where you don't feel safe or you don't feel free to be totally honest with the marriage counselor about what's going on at home 
and how you're feeling. If you're afraid to say that because you're going to hurt his feelings or he's going to be mad or I'm going to pay for that on the way home with a scary car drive home, then don't go. Why would you waste your money? Marriage counseling is expensive. It's 125, 150, sometimes $200 an hour. Why would you waste your money pretending the problem is this when the problem is really this, right? And so you can't get help because the marriage counselor isn't a mind reader. They're going to go by what you say. And if you say, well, you know, it's not that bad or, you know, it is that bad, but, you know, it's probably, you know, I don't know. It's probably me. It's probably my, if you're not able to really be honest with what you think and what you feel and what you experience at home, don't go to marriage counseling. So the first reason, if there's any history of a pattern of abuse, deceit, addictions, that's not your problem. That's his problem. It causes you problems in the marriage, but it's his problem to fix. Number two, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel safe enough to be totally honest with the marriage counselor, why go? Don't waste your money because the marriage counselor isn't going to get a clear diagnosis. Even when you're not a marriage counselor officially, let's say you go to your pastor. If you can't talk honestly about what's really going on, if you can't tell someone that he spit in your face or that he held you down and raped you, if you can't say that because it's too shameful, and I understand sometimes the worst abuse is the shameful stuff. If you can't say that, then don't go because your pastor or your counselor won't get a picture of what's really going on. And if you let your husband control the narrative, because you're afraid to interrupt or you're afraid to speak up, then don't go. Go by yourself. Do your own work. Because marriage counseling won't help the problem if you can't describe the problem, honestly, from your perspective. Right? So that's the second reason. I'm bored. Third reason. <clears throat> your husband says he'll go, and you're so excited because finally, finally, you've been nagging him for years. Maybe he's more of the indifferent kind of husband and he's really checked out and he's not been, he's been neglectful and he's been a workaholic and he finally goes. Why is he going? Or maybe you've threatened to leave him and now he's willing to go to marriage counseling. All right. So in my experience, and I'm not alone in counseling, I do a lot of training with counselors. And if you're a counselor, listen to this. This is really important. Even if you're a lay counselor, small group leader, all those kind of things. When a couple comes to you for counseling, one of the first questions I ask them is, why are you here? Why are you here? And if he is saying things like, well, I'm here because she wants me to be here. I'm here because she's unhappy. I'm here because she's going to leave me if I don't come. I'm here because I want to try to make our marriage better. Okay. Those all suck the counselor into thinking he's a client. But if he's not a client, you can't do marriage counseling. And how many of you have experienced that where you've gone into marriage counseling and the problem is you, you're too sensitive, you're too reactive, you're too jealous, you're too suspicious, you have issues from your childhood and that's why you don't trust him, um, you're the provoker and that's why he screams at you. And now it's not really marriage counseling, it's him saying things to the counselor and you feeling afraid to speak up for yourself or speaking up for yourself and doing it in a crazy kind of reactive way. And now you look like the one who's got bipolar or borderline personality disorder. And he's sitting there saying, thinking, believing, I'm here to help her get better so our marriage can get better. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> some of the light bulbs are going on, right? So when someone's not there for themselves, so I might ask that person who's kind of there because of you, you want him. So why are you here? What do you need to change to make this marriage better? What do you, what kinds of things have you done that have harmed the marriage? If he can't come up with anything, and many times they couldn't when they would come together and I'd ask those questions, he'd go, well, I'm, I'm really here to support her. I mean, she wants me to come and I'm here. I don't really believe in marriage counseling. You know what I say to them? You're dismissed. I'll stay with you and work with you if you want, wife, but you're dismissed. Because the danger, this is what happens, friends. The danger is when the marriage counselor, so let I'm going to give you a, a scene that happened in my marriage counseling. <clears throat> okay, so the husband would blow up 
and say vile things because the wife was disorganized and he couldn't find stuff. He couldn't find the pen by the telephone. He couldn't find any other reasons too, but that was one that they talked about. Okay. So do you hear it? It's her problem. She's so disorganized. That's why I blow up. I don't have anything to work on. If only she would get more organized or she would be more sexual, whatever it is, I wouldn't have an affair, all that. Right. And here's where the counselor makes the critical mistake because the wife is there to be a client and she'll say, you know, I am disorganized or I know I don't keep the house as well as he wants me to now. Okay. How can we help you get more organized? How can we help you be, you know, the woman he wants you to be? How can we help you, you know, do the things that he wants so he won't act that way. Now, it's your responsibility, and I'm not saying you shouldn't get organized. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when you do that in a marriage setting, it creates three more problems. The first problem is it starts to give you hope. Okay, if I work with this counselor on this problem, my disorganization or my sexual resistance to him or my hurts from childhood that I don't like sex or whatever it is, if I work on that, then we're going to have a better marriage because he's not working on anything, right? He's not working on anything. This gives you false hope that it's your problem. He acts that way. Now, I'm not saying it's not your problem that you don't provoke him. You might provoke him. He probably provokes you too, right? I mean, I've been married 45 years. My husband provokes me a whole lot of stuff and I provoke him and a whole lot of stuff, right? But we don't abuse each other. We deal with it. We have healthy communication or we forbear or whatever we choose to do. We don't lie or cheat or deceive or abuse, right? And so it gives you this false hope that if I change, he'll be happy and then he'll love me and we'll have this great marriage. The second false thing it does is it kind of feeds his lie that it is your fault he acts this way. If only you would have sex six times a day. If only you would, you know, do it the way he wants. If only you would be totally organized and he would never be frustrated and never have to look for a pen by the phone. Then he wouldn't say those awful things to you. Friend, you can't control him. Now, you can make his life easier and smoother and more peaceful, but he's still going to get aggravated about something. And if he feels entitled to vomit all over you when he gets aggravated because you can't create a perfect environment for him, you're sunk because you can't. You can't be the perfect wife, right? And if he doesn't take some ownership of, I need to learn self-control when I'm upset, not don't ever upset me life because I can't control myself. But I need to learn self-control when I'm upset. He's never going to grow. So it feeds a second lie that somehow you're hit at the fault of this. And the third lie it feeds is it feeds this entitlement lie that I'm entitled to a wife who never upsets me. Now, how's that working? That's not possible. When I do marriage uh, retreats and I do marriage conferences for pastors and counselors and stuff, I say, how many of you have had a marriage where your spouse never upset you? It's not possible. It's not possible. We get upset about stuff, but that doesn't give us a right to cheat and lie and abuse someone else. And we have this mindset that you made me do it because you acted this way. As a counselor, we're just colluding with that mindset by turning to the victim and saying, well, you need to work on this. I worked with a couple and I'll just, so here's an example of what happens. This is the mistake I made. And thank God the Holy Spirit like pulled me back before I said the wrong thing. So I'm working with this couple in marriage counseling. He had been abusive to her. He spit at her and he pushed her down because, see, he was an elder in the church. He was a very spiritual sounding man. He was a very kind of a charming man, actually. She wasn't as charming. She was very rough around the edges. She was a woman who was kind of a Martha personality. She had six kids. She was homeschooling them all. She was trying to be the perfect woman, of course, with resentment. <laughs> And exhaustion, right? So she's trying to do all this to be the perfect, you know, biblical wife. And, you know, her husband's wanting some time. He wants some attention. He wants some wife and husband time. And she's got six kids and laundry to fold and homeschool to prepare. And she doesn't have time for him, right? And he's getting a little angry. Rightly so. How he handles his anger is his decision. So he says, can't you just sit down and talk to me? She goes, no, I've got five baskets of laundry to fold and I've got baths to give and homework to do and I can't do that right now. And so he got angry and started being abusive, right? It would be so tempting in that moment to turn to her because we can see she has issues with not connecting. We can see that as a marriage counselor. 
But is this the time to say to her, hey, how come you don't want to give him any time? What's going on? Maybe she wouldn't feel safe to say that. Or maybe she does have issues, right? I'm not saying you guys are perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all have issues. But this is the mistake in marriage counseling. So it's, you know, he's saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this. It's terrible. I know I'm wrong. But her, but her, she never has time for me. All I want is 15 minutes a night where we could sit down with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just connect. Oh, that's all I want. Counselor, can't you help me get through to her? And he looks like this pitiful spiritual man who's just lost it because of his withholding wife. And it's easy to turn to the withholding wife and say, hey, this is your biblical responsibility or why can't you connect with your husband or what's going on with you? Bad idea. But here's where I was tempted right then to do that. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, stay with him. So this is what I said to him. I said, wow, that must be really painful to want to connect with your wife every night and her to turn you down. Yeah, I'm so upset. She just doesn't love me like I need her to. And she doesn't have any time for me with all these kids. And, you know, I don't want all her whole night. I just want a couple minutes for us to be a husband and a wife. What's wrong with that? Thank God I didn't turn to her and say, why can't you do that? I stayed with him and I said, you know what? You're right. It's very disappointing for you right now. And what happens to you when you're disappointed and you don't get what you want? That's his responsibility, right? What happens to you? Yes, we have marriage problems here. But if I say, oh, this is the problem. That's why you act that way. He's going to start believing, see, the counselor agrees with me. It's your problem I act that way. It's not. They do have a problem. But for me to work on that colludes with his belief that it's her fault that I act that way. And most marriage counsels would do exactly what I almost did. And thank God I didn't do that. Because I said to him, yeah, you are really disappointed and you have every right to be. So how are you going to handle yourself in a godly man next, in a godly way next time when you don't get what you want? Because she's saying she can't right now. Right? And thankfully, the light started going on for him, but that doesn't always happen in counseling. Abuse is a choice. Yeah, it's a choice. It's someone something someone uses to get what they want or punish you when they're not getting what they want. They want power and control over you. Now, I'm not saying she was acting all that great. She wasn't. And I might have said, hey, I think each of you need some counseling, which is what I eventually said. You need counseling for working on why you can't control yourself when you're upset. And you may need some help in things that you want to work on for yourself. Do you want to get more organized? Do you want to work on having better boundaries so that you're not so exhausted? Right? But those are separate issues. Those aren't marriage issues. And when you work on the marriage, you're working on a we, not it's your fault. I acted this way. So the first reason is whenever there's any patterns of abuse, addictions, deceptions, adultery, those kind of things. No. The second is if you know, you're not going to be honest with the marriage counselor. No. And you could even say that to your husband. You could say something like, you know, I don't think marriage counselor is going to help us because whenever we've gone before, you're mad at me when I'm honest and I can't be honest and be afraid that you're going to be mad at me. And so we're not going to get anywhere. So if you'd like to go, I'd certainly like to go for myself. And if you'd like to go for yourself, <clears throat> maybe we can work on things, but I'm not willing to do marriage counseling. The third reason you don't do marriage counseling is that your husband's not really a client. So if he says, I'll go, say, why? Well, I want our marriage to work. So what do you have to work on? I don't know. The counselor told me. There's no inner sense of, I need to work on controlling myself so I don't hit you when I get upset. I need to work on my lust problem so I don't watch porn. Whatever it is, there's no sense of I have a problem. Nobody goes to the doctor and says, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm here. I don't have it. I don't know what I have. I don't have a problem. My wife tells me I have a problem, right? Nobody goes to the doctor that way. You don't go to the counselor that way. You go to the counselor saying, I have a problem. Help me. That's why you're there, right? That's what you're paying for. If you don't think you have a problem, don't go. Don't go. And the last reason, if you should happen he <clears throat> out here to be a people helper, you might be a pastor, maybe you're a counselor, maybe you're a lay leader in your church and you do some 
you know, marriage mentoring counseling. The reason that you don't do marriage counseling or coaching or whatever together is that the counselor themselves, part of the mandate of marriage counseling or marriage coupling work is that you stay neutral. You don't take sides, right? You don't take sides. You can't because how can you work with both of them if you're saying you're bad, you're good, you're right, you're wrong. We, we can't do that. That's one of the tenets in marriage counseling is you stay neutral. And when there is obvious sin against someone, oppression, abuse, addictions, deceptions, adultery, you can't stay neutral. God calls us not to stay neutral. And bullying literature actually says there are three parts of the bully relationship. The bully, the bullied, and the bystander, the person who's watching. And the most important person in that triad is the bystander because the bully is exerting power and control over the bullied. The bullied feels helpless and powerless. They're being bullied. And if the bystander in a school situation, for example, if a, if a football player was bullying another athlete or bullying a, a woman and, and harassing her and demeaning her, calling her fatso or something like that, and another football player came in as the bystander said, hey, we don't talk to women like that. Cut it out. Who do you think you are? That's powerful. When the counselor doesn't say, that's abusive. That's wrong. When you talk that way, it's ungodly. And we don't because we're not supposed to. Right? We're not supposed to. It's a rare counselor that will confront someone like that in a marriage counseling setting. Martin Luther King said it best when he said, it wasn't the words of our enemies that hurt the most. It was the silence of our friends. How many of you have been in a marriage counseling situation, right? And you're in it. And your husband says something awful or does something hurtful. And the counselor doesn't validate you or confront him. Or you wire up your courage and you share an incident. And they don't say it was abusive. They don't define it as that. And it just lets you down. And it, just, it lets your husband believe what I did wasn't that bad. If it was that bad, the counselor would have said so. When the counselor doesn't say it, you're just hypersensitive. What's wrong with you? Right? And so we don't do marriage counseling because we know that if we were to call that person out and say, your behavior right here, right now, was demeaning and abusive to your wife. Is that how you want to be? Most of them would get up and walk right out the door and they wouldn't come back. And so we don't say that because we want them as a client, but we're, they're not really a client because we can't be honest. So those are the four reasons. I hope you got them down. I want to open it up for questions, but let me just look at the feed a little bit. My glasses are all fuzzy. I can't read really well. All right. <clears throat> you have an amazing counselor. Good. Most marriage challenges have a foundation in personal work first to understand what's really at the center of the struggle. Absolutely. Because we do all have issues, right? And, and in our webinar next week, we're going to talk about that because your husband may be 100% abusive, 100% deceptive, 100% wrong, 100% messed up in lots of areas or 50% or whatever percentage you want to put it. But you're still taking it you're still enduring it. You're still putting up with it. You're still whitewashing it. You're still placating it. You're still forbearing it. You're still pretending with it for a reason. And those are your issues, right? Those are your issues. And you have to look at your issues because there's things that are keeping you stuck there. There's things that are keeping him that way. And there are things that are keeping you in this dance too, right? A dance takes two. And one person can wreck a dance for sure. Um, and you can't dance well without both people dancing. But you've got your own dance steps to learn to do differently. So that same old dance can't continue. And I'm going to give you some of those steps ne next week. Not just on how do we build a back a we, if that's possible. But how do I build back a me, if that's not possible? And even if we do start to build back a we, I still have a me to build back. Because I've been traumatized or betrayed or brokenhearted, or I can't even trust my own self anymore, let alone him, because I thought he was a great guy and he turned out to be a great liar. 
How do I know how to pick a good guy or a good friend even? I can't trust myself. Where do I go from here? And this is your work to do, friend. This is your work to do. And maybe the marriage will fail. You don't know that for sure. But you don't have to fail. And this is where the transition becomes of, I've got to save my marriage by clinging to it. To I've got to work on myself to be the woman that God called me to be. And then go from there and see what happens. All right, I want to open it up to questions. So I'm going to move over to my assistant where she helps me <coughs> through the questions. And I don't know why my computer is telling me. It's got about 15 screens up and I don't. Just pull up a new window and get the questions down. If you have questions about this topic, marriage counseling, put it in the feed. <clears throat> Tomorrow we're going to do a Facebook Live with my coach Leanne on how to stop reacting and learn to respond. All right. When we react, just like in that marriage counseling setting, Sometimes the woman starts to look like the one who needs more help than the man, right? Because he's cool, calm, and collected, and you're reacting. And you're reacting to horrible behavior. And you should respond to some way in, to horrible behavior. But how you do that will make a difference in your own emotional and spiritual and mental health, as well as the way you're perceived by others right? And so sometimes when you're in a toxic situation, you become toxic as well. And so we just want to help you pull back, get some fresh air, take some time to nourish and nurture yourself so that you're not reacting in like to what's happening to you. All right. And we'll tease that out some more tomorrow, but be sure to show up for tomorrow, same time. And then Thursday, we're going to do a Facebook live in the evening. So we'll do it at 730 Eastern time. Um, I'll be there again. And it's going to be about the subtle forms of abuse. What about the non-obvious forms? What are the subtle things? What do I need to look for? All right. <clears throat> All right. So let me get another drink. My husband doesn't seem to validate my emotions and thoughts <clears throat> and remains emotionally distant despite marriage counseling for nine months. How do I, how long do I wait for a change? Well, I think the first thing that you would ask him is, do you want to change this? Right? So I feel lonely and neglected in our marriage. And I've told you that the counselors told you that we've been going to counseling for nine months and you don't seem to want to put any energy in changing that is, am I right? So I would just lay it on the table. So, <clears throat> you know, change only happens when someone wants to change because change is hard. We're going to talk about that in the webinar. If you haven't signed up for the webinar, let me just tell you a little bit about it. It's going to be how long do I keep trying and how will I know the changes are real? So you've been trying nine months. You don't see any changes. I would revisit that question. Is this something you want to do? Remember we talked yesterday about the intrinsic motivation versus the extrinsic motivation. If I'm just motivated to change, to keep you here, that's not a strong enough motivation, usually long-term. So he's kind of putting in the minimum, going to marriage counseling, making it look like he's willing to change when he's not really doing the work to change. And so I think it's time to call it for what it is, not judge it. So call it. I'm not seeing the results from marriage counseling that I had hoped. And I'm wondering if it's not because it's because you're not really invested, that you're there because I want you to be there. You're there to kind of check that off the box. We tried that, but that you're not really willing to do the work to know me, to hear me, to connect with me, that that's not of interest to you. And that's a hard statement to say, but that gives him a chance to be honest. No, I'm not. It scares me. I don't know how to do it. It scares me. I don't want to, I, it feels terrifying. I just can't see myself going there. Right. Or I don't uh, No, I don't want to do it. It's too hard. I don't know how to do it. It feels so unnatural to me. I'm just, I'm not that kind of guy. Okay. So then you're gonna have to decide whether you're gonna have a disappointing marriage. We don't have that connection or whether that's so destructive to you that you can't live that way. And only you can decide that right? Nobody can't tell you you have to one way or the other. You have to decide that, but it'd be better to have an honest marriage than where you're frustrated that you don't know where he's at. So ask him. 
<clears throat> for the free week shop, workshop, do I need to be married? I'm separated, but trying to see if this would help me discern if I can save my marriage. Um, yes, it will help you discern whether you can save your marriage. But let me just tell you, you, you can't save your marriage by yourself, right? A marriage cannot be repaired without both people investing in the repair. Right? You can't save a marriage all by yourself. You can break a marriage all by yourself, but you can't save a marriage all by yourself. And so if your husband isn't invested in saving your marriage and isn't willing to do the work that he needs to do to save it, then there isn't, a, there isn't a, a prayer in the world that your marriage is going to be saved. You can stay married legally, but there is no marriage, right? And so I think it's really important for you to get clear on what you can do and what you can't do, right? So as much as you, we've talked about this in many different ways, but as much as you'd like to save your adult child from alcoholism, or you'd like to save your husband from his porn habit, or you'd like to save your mother from her smoking or whoever is doing something that's unhealthy and you see it, you see it. You can't fix that for them. Only they can do that work, right? I mean, if they asked for your help, you could drive them to AA. You could, you know, prepare meals for them so they eat healthier. You could, um, you know, manage your money so they don't have extra money to, for temptation. However, if they asked, but if they're not asking for help to change, you could do all those things and they could still do their actions, right? So if they're not wanting to change to make a marriage work, there isn't a prayer of a chance that God's going to change them without their will. Right? God doesn't change anybody without their willingness and their humility of, I need to change, Lord, change me, right? God doesn't just swoop down and say, hey, you need a, you need a bath. I think I'll give you a bath or you need a mind change. I'm going to cl cleanse your mind. It's we renew our mind with God's truth and he gives us his wisdom when we ask for it, all right? So understand that there isn't any zero, zero hope of repairing your relationship. And I'm going to be that clear in the webinar, all right? So some of you aren't that clear, but some of you are afraid to ask. But if someone doesn't want to change, if I don't, I live on an 18th hole of a golf course. I've lived here five years. I have never picked up a golf course, cup, club, ball, golf club, or hit a ball right from the tee out, you know, 50 yards from my house. Never. I have no interest, no desire. I bought the house because I love the view. <laughs> you could buy me a really expensive pair of golf clubs. You could pay for a golf membership. I'm not going. I have no interest in it. I'm not doing it. You can't make me learn golf. I have every opportunity, but I'm not interested, right? It's that clear. You can't make someone do something they don't want to do. And sometimes we really want to do something, like we want to lose weight or we want to exercise better. And it's still really hard. But if we don't want to do it, playing golf is really hard. I have a friend who's a golfer and he pl plays every single day. He, if he doesn't play games, he's putting or he's hitting balls every single day. I don't want that. I don't want it that much. I, I don't want it at all. But I don't, even if I wanted it, I wouldn't want it that much. And so you got, it, change is hard. And you have to really want something and love something to work at that. Don't fool yourself. All right. How do I try to break out of self-induced isolation at church? I don't want to be fake. So I've been keeping to myself because my family is falling apart. Hubby isolates himself due to mental health trauma addiction, which has resulted in me grieving for over a decade about our marriage. And I've struggled to be a good mom when solo for 10 years for four kids, trying to grow and move on, but so hard. It is hard <clears throat> and God hasn't designed you. So the fact that you're struggling is good because if you weren't struggling, then you wouldn't change, right? So if I, if I hold this nostril, it's harder to breathe, right? But I'm not designed to breathe this way. I'm designed to breathe with two nostrils and it's much easier, right? You're not designed. God hasn't designed us to go through life solo. And I'm not saying that everybody should be married. But he has called us to have a sense of connection and belonging to one another. There's a lot of one another passages in the Bible. Um, social scientists, neuroscientists now know that the brain is hardwired to connect. Even an infant, when they're born and they show them pictures on the wall, red ball, giant sun, star, and a face, which one do they focus on? Face, face, they're hardwired to connect. They want to find a face. They want to look into a face. Babies look 
at mommy's faces, right? They want to connect. Mommies look at baby's faces. That's the bonding time. And so the fact that you're feeling that is a good sign because it shows you you're not dead and that you, it, just like when you're feeling hungry, what does it motivate you to do? It motivates you to feed yourself. When you're feeling tired, you go to sleep because you need it. You need it. If you didn't feel sleepy, we'd be working all night, right? So we need that restoration. You need community. You need companionship. And you may not have that from your husbands, but you need that from some girlfriends. You really, really do. And so I would encourage you to do two things. Number one, I would encourage you to take a step of faith and either speak to your pastor and just say, you know, I really need um, some mentoring or some shepherding or some uh one anothering from another older woman in my church. Is there someone who's got some time that would be willing to, you know, spend some time with me on some areas that I'd like to, to talk with her about, right? So that even if you can't afford professional help, whatever, you might be able to get that in your church. And the second thing I would really encourage you to do is, I don't know if you um, have heard of our Conquer group, but our Conquer is an amazing, amazing online support group for women in destructive marriages. And we will be talking about that next week at the webinar. After I'm done teaching it for an hour, I will talk about joining this group because so many women are isolated. And because this topic is so shameful um, for Christian women, especially, you feel like such a failure and you feel like, you know, what's wrong with me that I can't make my marriage work? Everybody else can make their marriage work. What's wrong with me that my husband doesn't love me? Everybody else doesn't. You know, we just get into this mindset of, I'm all alone and no one's like me. And you see on the feed, you've got plenty of girlfriends here that are like you, right? And in the, in the, in the webinar that we do, it's, a, it's so helpful, even if you don't join Conquer, it's so helpful because it's offline. So you don't have to worry about privacy. It's in a separate space. So that's why we need to sign up so that we can invite you with a link to, to join the webinar. And all of a sudden you're seeing people, women from all over the world who say, me too. I'm lonely too. Me too. I don't talk to anybody about that. Me too. No one knows what's going on in my life. Me too. I'm in an abusive marriage. Me too. Me too. I've been sexually abused in my marriage by my husband. Me too. And you're like, oh my gosh, I am not alone. And I don't have to walk through this alone. And so I would just encourage you to do those two things. Take those first two brave girl steps. And as you start taking care of you and getting stronger, Things about what to do out here become much clearer. When we're just reacting like a pinball, you know, pinball machine ball, boing, 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 going from thing to thing because we're not, we don't have a center. We don't have a core strength yet. Then we're just lost really. And we're just living in the moment, reacting to the moment. And we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live that way. And so, but we might need some help and how to do that. And so, I'll give you that help net. I'm giving you these helps in the Facebook lives free at the webinar free. I want to do that. And then for those of you who want a little bit deeper and more intensive support and help in a community that's structured um, and, and accountable, um, then, then that will be your next step if you'd like to join Conquer. And it's only open twice a year. So if you don't join this uh, round in April, we won't open it again until October of next year. But we would love to have you consider that. And we'll talk more about that at the webinar. All right. The workshop. All right. Um, I think I answered this. You don't need to be married. No, you don't need to be married to attend because we'll be talking about a lot about you. What do you need to do to get healthy and strong? If you've been in a destructive marriage or you're not married at all, but you tend to have girlfriends who are controlling or indifferent or take advantage of you. So if you're struggling in any kind of relationship, this will help you uh, understand what your work is to do. All right. My ex used to get angry and mock me when I'd come home after a support group meeting. What are some ways that I could respectfully respond to comments like that. It depends on your goal. All right. So if you are, if you are just wanting to speak the truth for yourself to remind you that I am me and you are you, and that may not be your cup of tea, but it's my cup of tea. Um, that might be helpful. So if you're trying to say the right thing, so he goes, Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That's really helpful for you. Um, I don't have those words because we can't, make him change by our words, right? We can invite him to change by our words, but even Jesus, the master wordsmith, the master communicator, didn't get everybody to change by their words, right? His words to Judas, Judas, what are you about to do? You sure you want to do this? His words to the Pharisees, you, you're blind guides, you're leading the blind. They didn't hear, they didn't listen. They were 
deaf and they were blind. So your husband's a mocker and the Bible talks about mockers. And it says, actually, don't answer a mocker in the way that they talk because it just stirs more things up. And then sometimes in Proverbs, kind of right after that, it says, is answer a mocker. So I think what it's saying is you don't know how the mocker is going to respond. So you say what you need to say. And I'll give you two versions. Hey, what's that about? What bothers you so much when I go to my support group that you have to act like that? So that would be more of a opportunity for him to look at himself. Right? Oh, I don't know. I just don't, I don't know why you need that. Well, I do need that. Why is that such a mocking thing for you? And it may give him an opportunity to reflect. Or you could say something like, you know, I don't like hunting. And I can't imagine myself going hunting. But when you go hunting, I don't make fun of you when you come home. So I like to go to the support group. It does something for me that I need. You might not like it just like I don't like hunting. Why is it that what I do, what I like, you feel it's okay to make fun of me? So that would be another way of saying. Both of those ways will reinforce to you that he does things he likes that you don't like, and it's okay. And you can do things that he doesn't like or approve of, and it's okay. Because my guess is by his mocking, he's trying to, he feels, my guess is, and I, I could be wrong, that he feels threatened by you getting stronger. And that often is the case. As you get stronger, the, the more unhealthy person in the relationship gets threatened by that because then they know you're not going to keep putting up with it. So they try to stop you from getting stronger. They'll control you by their mocking. They'll control you by their anger. They'll control you by their lying. However they can control you, they'll try to control you, right? So mocking is a form of getting you to feel shame about what you're doing so that you'll stop doing it, right? So I would just, the reason you need to say those things to yourself is so that you don't let that work. You don't let his mocking make you feel like, ooh, what's wrong with me that I, that I need a support group? Something's wrong with me. He, he doesn't need a support group. Why do I need a support group? I'm, I'm the deficient one. I'm the unhealthy one. I'm, you know, and it's easy to go there. That's why, that's why you need the support that we're talking about so that you don't go there. But at least say it out loud to yourself. And if it doesn't, if it just ends up in more conflict on the outside, at least say it to yourself on the inside. When he starts mocking you, say, you know, he's mocking me and I don't have to listen to this. I'm going to the support group because it's good for me to do that. Just like if you were drinking orange juice in the morning or you were taking your vitamins and someone said, oh, so you need those vitamins. Oh, it's so expensive. Why are you eating those vitamins? And you just say to yourself, I'm eating these vitamins because they're good for me. And that's what I choose to do. And you don't have to say that out loud to them because they don't care. But you're saying that to yourself because people will do what they will do. And they're trying to get you to stop doing what you're doing. That's healthy for you. All right. So if you understand the motivation, just don't let it work. All right. Um, let's see. I'm not afraid to be honest, but he lives in his own reality, not the truth. So it gets nowhere. How do I handle it when we're not even in the same page or in reality? Well, so your reality is your reality. His reality is his reality. Truth is somewhere probably in the middle at times, or sometimes we don't, none of us live in total truth because the Bible tells us that we self-deceive ourselves, right? So no one, that's why we need one another. So, so, so if we can get ourselves off of the idea that I'm always right and he's always wrong, or I always see things clearly and he always sees things distorted, um, that can help you quite a bit um, because we do have things to learn from one another, but the Bible tells us in Hebrews 3.13, for example, let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So none of us sees truth and reality 100% clearly. All right. So that if you can take yourself from that place to more of a neutral place, this is, this is my version of reality. This is his version of reality, or this is my version of what makes sense to me. And this is his version of what makes sense. To me. It becomes less toxic or less pejorative. Like I'm right. He's wrong. I'm good. He's bad, which was what we see in our culture right now. So just take it from the Democrats, to the Republicans, very different worldview, right? About everything. 
and I'm not playing politics here. All right. I do have a preference for most things, not everything. But what I do do is I say, what can I learn from the other side? What can I learn that I don't know from this side? Because this side isn't saying it. What can I learn from the other side? How do I listen carefully to both points of view and pray for wisdom? Right. I think that's really important today um, because we are very polarized in our families and our churches, you know, churches, they have certain beliefs about certain things. Like I'm just going to say something off the top of my head. Like we don't, nobody speaks in tongues anymore. That's a, that's a doctrinal belief of some churches. Right. And they're entitled to their beliefs. What they're not entitled to say is, and I'm 100% certain that this is the accurate version of my beliefs. We don't know for sure. This is the stand you're taking. It's okay. And some people take a different stand <laughs> and do speak in tongues. And that's what they believe. And so I think it's really important for us to not demonize other people for thinking or believing differently. Okay. So that's the first part of it. So that helps us have more humility. Like I could be wrong. Maybe I could rethink. Maybe I could listen better to his point of view. Right. Maybe I could ask curious questions about his point of view so that we're not arguing so much about who's right and who's wrong, but we're listening more to how we're different, all right? We might be very different, right? You might be married to an atheist and you might be a born again Christian. You might be married to a liberal and you're a conservative. And, you know, those are very different points of view about everything, but how do we listen? Not necessarily agree, but how do we respectfully listen? How do we ask curious questions? How do we get to know one another? Because maybe there's something about what you're saying that rings true. So it, it, let me just give you another example. In, in the biblical mythetic counseling movement, when, when I first got started, it was like, no, psychology, psychology is toxic. We're not listening to any psychology because that's anti-biblical. It's not. Truth is truth. And whether it's discovered in, um, you know, in, in psychology or whether it's discovered and, and confirmed in the Bible, whatever. So, so, so if I read something in psychology that says, oh my gosh, this is in the Bible, what I think affects my emotions. Did you know that cognitive behavioral therapy is all about what you think and how that affects your emotions? And the Bible says, my thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. Sometimes we demonize something that's not necessarily bad. Some of it's bad, but not all of it. So this is where we have to be more discerning that the Bible teaches that we need discernment so that we can discern right from wrong or truth for error. So let me just look at the bottom line question. So how do I handle when we're not even on the same page of reality? What I would say is you, you have a decision to make. Do I invite conversation about that? Hey, we're on a very different page. Can you describe your page for me a little bit more clearly? Because I, I don't get it. I don't understand why that's so important or why, why you think that way. Or, you know, invite him to give you more of his reality. And that way you might have to say at the end of the day, we are so opposite, not you're so wrong and I'm so right, but we are so opposite on our worldview and on what's right and what's wrong and what we need to do to fix this. I don't know that we can have a mutual path forward. What do you think? And so if you can have a respectful conversation, a curious conversation instead of a condemning judgmental conversation, whether you stay married or you don't stay married, you might end up having a better relationship than you would if you're so sure you're right, he's wrong, and you stay married and fight like cats and dogs all the time. All right. So that, that's what I would start with. I would start with. And, you know, and and go for it. even an issue that you're absolutely sure you're right on. Um, so I'm debating about whether I want to say this out loud. <laughs> so give me a minute to, to check myself. Um, so I'm going to take a chance and just be honest with you about my past. Um, so, and I har hardly ever, I speak about this sometimes in a, in a group when it's appropriate. So I'll just trust that it's appropriate right now. Um, when I first got out of graduate school, so I, I got my master's in social work and in social work curriculum in a secular school, I was a Christian, but I was not a on fire Christian, but I was a believer. And, but I, but I was indoctrinated with a certain belief system that you are neutral as a counselor, you are neutral, right? That's what you are. You don't put judgment on someone's stuff. You can't because you can't listen to them well if you judge them as bad or wrong, right? 
So one of my very first jobs after getting my degree was working in a hospital as a clinic, as a medical social worker. And this was in the seventies when Roe v. Wade was passed. And so I was assigned to do all the abortion counseling and that's what I did. And so in, in one sense, the Holy Spirit was niggling at me. This, this isn't something you should be doing, Leslie. And on the other hand, I'm like, I have compassion for a 15 year old who's pregnant and doesn't want to, doesn't want to have a baby because she wants to go to college and she that was date raped and all of the reasons people get, right? So what do I do? You know, what do I do? I can see both sides of the issue. And I had to land on a side and I landed on the side where I, 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 as a Christian, I just can't do this. I can't participate in this. But I certainly can understand the desperation of a woman who feels like she can't go through something, right? I can't, I don't think that's the answer, but I understand. And so I have a very, so later on in my career, I debated different pro-life and pro-choice people and all that. That's in my past. And so I don't like to bring up political issues. But my point is, is that I took a stand on this is how I see it for me. And this is what I can do. I can't do this anymore. And I certainly understand why you think that's the best choice for you. I don't think that is, but that's your life and you get to decide that. I don't decide that for you. And I think that creates a, a, a much more willing environment for us to have conversations about people who are different than us, that we don't demonize them for being different and we understand why they think they think the way they think, um, especially when they don't have the Lord to rely on. But, but to be able to be able to hold an understanding for why they think that way, even if we don't agree with it. Okay, so I hope that clarifies things for you. What's the best way to respond as a bystander when you confront a bully and they turn on you? <laughs> yep. Um, so I've had that as the counselor. And I think it depends on how you confront the bully for one thing. Um, so you can confront them in a winsome, uh, humorous way. And it really depends. You can't control the bully. All you can control is your side of the street, right? So I remember working with a couple once in marriage counseling, again, when I should have been doing marriage counseling <laughs> with them because it was a destructive relationship, but I didn't know what I know now. And he, she came in and she said, I want to talk about something that happened, you know, last night. He didn't want to talk about that. And he, so he says, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this. And I just turned to him and I said, and who put you in charge? <laughs> at me like, what? Like no one's ever said that to me before. So sometimes you can do it in a winsome way. Um, I've done it in a, another way. Is, but I had some voice because I was a professional. So when, when somebody was abusing their wife in the moment, I said, excuse me, could I interrupt for a second? And you know, he looks at me and I said, you're paying me $125 an hour to work on repairing your relationship. And what you did right now just wasted our money is that what you want to do? Like you're saying you want our marriage to be fixed and yet you're doing things that are destructive, like you're setting your house on fire. I don't understand. Right? So I think you can confront in a winsome way if you have some relationship with those people. All right. Um, if you don't have a relationship with those people. So this is, I'm not saying this was a good thing, but I observed a parent abusing their child in a parking lot at an amusement park. And I just went up to him and I said, what you're doing is abusive and your kid's going to be in therapy with me <laughs> or someone like me in 20 years. And I hope you don't want that to happen to them. So please stop. <laughs> you know, he didn't like it at all, but his wife and his child heard that, that you don't deserve to be treated this way. And, you know, today I might get shot for doing that. So there's a risk when you do things. So I don't know what the specific situation was, but I think to pray for wisdom and, um, to speak out where you can. Last year, when I thought John MacArthur was inappropriately bullying Beth Moore, um, spoke out, not to him, but I spoke out. Um, so I think you have to decide where and when um, you can call a spade a spade and how you do that in a winsome, truthful, humble way versus a bully way. So sometimes a bully creates a bully and you're both bullying. Right. So if you can understand that your job is to speak the truth in love um, and then figure out what that might look like in this situation, it's not the same in every situation. But the bully often turns on you. That's for sure. The bully often turns on you. And um, I had a situation where I 
confronted a woman who was, you know, having multiple affairs and blaming her husband for it. And I just said, you know, this is not his problem. This is your problem. This isn't a marriage problem. This is your problem. And she got up and went, left. But he heard it. He heard it. This is not because of you. And that was powerful for him. So sometimes it's not for the benefit of the bully. It's for the benefit of the bullied that you stand up and say, this is wrong. Okay. Um, my marriage counselor said he doesn't want to get in between conflict. We're marriage counseling separate right now, about to get together all three of us in three weeks. Any thoughts? Well, I, I think what he's saying is, I don't want you to ask me to be the mediator of who's right and who's wrong. Right. I think in marriage counseling, that's what that's you don't want to get into that place of pick sides, marriage counselor. Right. Because then you're not neutral. So if it's a normal marriage counseling, your goal as a marriage counselor is help them figure out, not for you to decide or for you to figure it out for them. So your goal is to give them the tools to manage conflict in a healthy way, not to solve their conflict or pick sides on who's right and who's wrong. Right. So your job as marriage counselors to help them communicate clearly, for them to listen respectfully, for them to negotiate and compromise so that they can come to a decision that feels good for both of them. Um, and that's their decision to make, not yours as the counselor. So ideally, that's what a marriage counselor does. However, when there's a power and control struggle and one person gets a voice and the other person doesn't get a choice, <laughs> right? then then the marriage counselor may have to say, hey, it's it seems to me that you're not really having conflict. What you're having is you do what I say or else. And is that accurate? Like, does she have a voice? Does she have a choice here? Or if she doesn't want to do what you want to do, is there any compromise? Right. And that would be the speaking up to the bully. Right. If you noticed it. All right. Um, we're in marriage counseling. So, okay, I think, okay. My husband says I'm the one in the wrong but he refuses to tell me what I'm doing. He says that he will only tell me in front of a marriage counselor. We've been separated due to my intense fear of being around him and his ways. He suddenly decided to divorce me and he won't say why. He will only tell me if I go to a counselor with him. Am I wrong not to go? Um, that's up to you. I'm not your judge to tell you what you should do or don't do. I'm curious why you won't go. Um, I would go with boundaries. So you have to decide what your boundaries are, but I would go and say, if I'm at fault here, I'd really like to know if I've done something to offend you. Um, if you don't feel safe telling me here, um, I am not necessarily going to promise to go to counseling, but I will go to the counselor with you so that you can tell me in a safe place what's bothering you or why you're divorcing me. That would be really important information for me to know. I would want to know that. And then once it, I knew what it was, all right, then I would decide, wow, you're right. I did do that. And I have done that. And I didn't realize it bothered you so much. And I wish you would have told me because we probably could have worked on this. Had you told me, why couldn't you tell me? And then he might talk about his own passivity or his own reluctance. And is this something that you want to work on together to rebuild our trust or are you done? So th that can be an effective counseling session for clarification for you going forward. Um, and I would be interested in that as a wife whose husband told her that. Um, but you have to decide whether that's something that you want to do because it could be painful. You know, it could be painful what he tells you that he was too. I, I worked with a woman whose husband did that. Um, and he told her, you know, you're, you were just so negative, so negative, so negative all the time. And she was right. She said, I was right. I was negative. I was just cranky, negative, complaining wife all the time. And he, he never told her. He never, he just left <laughs> and then he told her and she was crushed that she didn't know first year of marriage instead of the 20th year of marriage. When I said, I've had it up to here and I can't take it anymore. And she went into counseling with me to work on her complaining, critical point of view. And, um, you know, and so she did her work then, which was good that she knew what it was so that she could do her work. Cause she said, I don't want to be that way. And I didn't realize I just kind of took over my mother's voice and became her and never developed me. And that was a wake up call for her. So it was a good thing, even though it was a very painful thing. So you might want to know. Um, I, I think if, if it were me, I'd want to know, but you'd have to decide. All right. How do you recommend bringing wise others in if counseling is to be held shrewdly or sort of not as a primary solution? I think that <clears throat> wise others, I think if you are, if you get wise and you say, um, we need help, 
okay, let's, let's do marriage counseling. Well, I'm willing to do marriage counseling at some point, but I've, I've done some reading or I've had a consultation with somebody or I watched a webinar. Or I, you know, and I don't think this is, or you don't even have to say that. I don't think that's the best first step. So marriage counseling is an, is a step, but the first step is, is he, if he's been chronically, um, so if he's got chronic addictions, chronic abusive behavior, chronic deception, adultery, and if that's the pattern, if you're in a destructive marriage, okay, I'm not talking about the difficult, disappointing marriage. If you're in a destructive marriage, then marriage counseling isn't the first step. The first step is you need to do each of you need to do your own work. He needs to do his work. I'll just say as the abuser, the abuser needs to do their own work or the betrayer, whoever they are, as to what was going on with them, that they allowed themselves to be that way. Even when they were stressed, even when they were provoked, even when they were tired, even when they were hungry. Why is it that it's okay for you to hurt another person in your life that you say you want to be with because you want to do marriage counseling? So why is it okay for you to act that way when you get upset? And if they can't work on that and answer that question, there is no repairing the relationship because nothing's going to change. The termites are still there and they're not willing to hire an exterminator to get them out, right? They're not even willing to admit they're there. Right. And so why would you do marriage counseling? And so I think the first step is for you to get strong enough then. So he's got his work to do. But sometimes we have our work to have a boundary and say, I don't think we've been to marriage counseling before. He doesn't think he has a problem until he sees he has. I have a problem. I'm willing to go. But until he sees he has a problem that he has to work on that's affecting our marriage, his lying, his anger, his cheating, his whatever it is, his addiction. If he's not willing to work on his alcohol addiction or his drug addiction, why would we spend money on marriage counseling? It's not going to work. We've been there, done that. And I think you could speak up for yourself. And if you can't, then you have your own work to do, right? Which is what we help women do in Conquer so that they can speak up for themselves, that they can have boundaries, that they can stand up for themselves. So they can get strong enough to have healthy relationships and invite their spouse into healthy relationships too but not to enable and collude with unhealthy relationships. So I think those are, you know, if your people help set, of course, marriage counseling is the, always the first option because they don't know better. They don't know better. They don't learn this in school. And so I think you can say just logically, if we have termites in our house and there's damage to the house because of the termites, fixing the damage isn't the first step. The first step is getting rid of the termites, right? And admitting that we have termites here. If we don't do that, fixing the damage, which is the marriage counseling piece of it, it's a waste of money because the damage is going to come back. It makes sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to them and they are arguing with you, I would say you're kind of in a toxic system that values the sanctity of marriage more than anything else. And so if you have to repair the damage again and again and again and again and again, it's better than being separated and saying, I can't live with termites. Right. And that's their theology and that you're not going to change that. All right. Just curious, could the abuser carry some form of. Awesome. Could the abuser carry some form of dislike, hatred toward their spouse? There is more dislike than love embedded in the abuser toward the spouse. I hope my question makes sense. You know, people, people do hate. People do hate even their spouse. Um, and I don't know if you're honest, probably all of us would raise our hand that we have hated our spouse in a moment of anger. I mean, that's sort of what comes out when you feel angry is hatred. Maybe even your child in a moment of anger, you don't say it. That's why you don't let feelings decide because you feel those feelings of rage or disgust or contempt or hatred over what someone's done, but you don't say, I hate you, right? But when someone treats you with contempt, with disrespect, with indifference. Like, I don't care if you're hurting. I don't care if you need that. It's not important to me. You're not important to me. And they may not say that exact wording, but their behaviors say that. You're not important for me to get up in the middle of the night and take you to the hospital. You're not important for me to come out and get you when you have a flat tire, call AA, AAA or whatever. So I think these are things that display a lack of care, right? And in our webinar next week, we'll talk about 
a lack of care breaks trust. I don't trust that you care about me. I don't trust that you care about my needs, my well-being, my goals, my dreams. All that matters is you. And there are people who are like that. And you may have married one. I don't know. Um, and there are people who are so angry about something that they feel that way all the time, but they're not that way all the time with others or whatever. And so I think that's where you have to discern, you know, what and talk about what happened in our marriage that you dislike me so much. And maybe he does dislike you because you stand for things that are against what he stands for. So the Bible tells us that darkness hates the light. So if you're light, meaning if you're walking in truth and you're walking in the Lord and you're speaking the truth in love and you're, you know, I mean, he stoned Stephen, <laughs> right? That was Apostle Paul was right there because he was light and the darkness didn't like the light. And so I don't know why your husband feels the way he does, but I think that for you to, here's the, here's the crazy making in the church and the Christian church. When someone hates you, whether you hate them or not, when they hate you and they've harmed you, they sort of become the status of an enemy, not a brother or sister, right? So the scriptures talk about husband, wife, brother, sister as family relationships, mother, child. And then it talks about pagans, tax collectors, which are, you know, not necessarily enemies, but they're not to be trusted. And then the Bible talks about enemies. You have enemies in your own household. It talks about that. So, so sometimes when someone hates you and has done you harm, they've moved into the status of an enemy, even if they're still your husband. And if your enemy, you know, has a need, feed them, pray for your enemies, love your enemies, do good to your enemies. So we're called as Christians to love our enemies, not so that our enemies change, although it may change our enemies, right? That may cause them to feel shame and repent, but it doesn't always. But loving our enemies helps us not to become ugly and distorted like our enemies, which happens in a destructive marriage that like begets light, right? Dark begets more dark instead of the light turning the dark into light. Dark can turn the light into dark if we let it. And so it's really important for you, knowing that you live with an enemy, how do I do that in a way that doesn't continue to destroy me? And that's may not be possible. And that's why I think the Christian church, the conservative Christian church has been really off teaching and somehow saying to a woman, you've got to make this marriage work, including sexual intimacy with your enemy. Who wants to sleep with their enemy? Who wants to kiss their enemy? Who wants to be naked in front of their enemy without feeling pure disgust and shame. And so this is so important that we understand that this is so important that we understand that when you're in an enemy status with someone, you don't have trust or safety and that takes its toll on you, right? The Bible says in Proverbs, it would be better to live in the corner of a rooftop than with an angry and contentious person because it takes its toll on you physically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and we can break down in all of those ways. And our children can break down. And so living with an enemy, just think about Ukraines and living with Russians around them and their, their enemy and how much stress they're under, right? You don't, you don't have a relationship with your enemy. They're your enemy. And so you're constantly on high alert and that will cause damage to you and, and to your children. And so be careful about what that looks like for you going forward. All right. All right. Um, what do you do when you know you are emotionally sensitive? Uh, a couple things. Honor that. Just like if you are gluten intolerant or you're gluten, you know, allergic to gluten, what would you do? you would honor that. You would say, this is who I am. This is what I can do. This is what I can eat. This is what I can't eat because this is harmful to me, right? So you would set some boundaries. I don't eat flour. I don't eat pizza. I don't eat French fries that are fried in oil that's fried with other breaded things, right? I have a friend who's gluten intolerant. So I know when we eat out, she has to ask all these questions, right? So if you know you're emotionally sensitive, you can't expect everyone to tiptoe around you and never 
ding you. So, so, so maybe a ding, if I got dinged here like this, you know, doesn't hurt me. But if I were physically sensitive, maybe I would get a bruise, right? And so I, I have to be, have a better boundary then. I don't want to be around people that would ding me. And they say, well, I'm just dinging you. You're too sensitive. Yes, I am sensitive, right? Or if you went to dinner with your mother and she said, oh, of course we're having pasta. This is, we're Italian. And, and you say, uh, but I'm sensitive. I can't eat pasta. So, so here's the deal. When we're sensitive or gluten-free or whatever, we would hope that the people who care about us the most know that and that they would not make fun of that or not put us in a situation where we had to be really tough with our boundaries. So I'll use the gluten again. If I were gluten sensitive and I had a family that knew I was gluten sensitive and we had a family dinner that I wasn't in charge of and they made nothing for me and just said, well, you're just sensitive, eat it anyway. This is what we have here. Take it or leave it. I probably would have a better idea of the care that I'm receiving from my family and that if I chose to go to the next family event, I would make sure I brought my own food. So I would take responsibility for me being sensitive instead of expecting them to care about me being sensitive. I've learned that they don't, right? They make fun of me because I'm sensitive to gluten. So I'm going to take responsibility for me and bring my own food or not go. Those are my choices. So I think this is where we get mixed up. We think because I'm emotionally sensitive, everybody should treat me with kid gloves and put me in a little glass bubble and never upset me. And that's just not reality. So I think there's two things. You need to take care of you. So if you're sensitive about certain things or some things, you know, bother you or how do I calm myself down? How do I learn to not take it personally? How do I develop a thicker skin when I need to? If somebody says something that makes me feel like it's my fault when it really isn't my fault, how do I learn to shake that off? Right? So how do I learn to do those things so that if they're, throwing stuff at me. It's not getting into me. Right. And how do I have better boundaries with those who, when I say, Hey, I'm sensitive to loud noises, or I'm sensitive to gluten, or I'm sensitive to, to sun. I don't want to go to the beach for vacation and they don't care. We're going to the beach. Well, then what do I need to do? Do I need to go? And I want to go. So I take an umbrella and I take sunscreen and I wear, you know, sun protection clothing. And I, you know, stay inside and read a book and enjoy the vacation in my way? Or do I just get resentful and angry that they're not caring that I'm so sensitive, right? So here's where we take responsibility for ourselves and we learn how to do that. And the more that we learn to do that, the stronger we get because we're not depending on someone else to take care of us because we're so sensitive, right? When I'm an adult and I'm gluten intolerant, I'm responsible for that, not my mom. Now, I hope she would care if we were having Thanksgiving and she would make something I liked, but I'm responsible for that because I'm the one who's going to get sick, right? If I'm emotionally sensitive, then I need to take responsibility for that and build some muscles so that I can handle some things better so I don't get so sick, right? And have better boundaries around people who are totally insensitive to my insensitive. And that's, I think that's the thing that we resist, and, and when we resist that, we're just as unhealthy as an abusive person who resists that, is that we want everybody else to fix things for us so we don't have to do our own work. So put pillows around every room that I'm in so that I don't knock myself, right? Nobody's going to do that for you. Nobody's going to do that for you in reality. And it's not a cruel thing. It's just reality. And so um, that's where you have to do your work. And that's where we focus on in Conquerors for women to help them do their work so that they don't get swept into a cruel and harsh relationship where they feel like they have no options. You do have options, right? Some of them, you may not like all of your options, but you do have them. And the more you realize you have them and can exercise them, the more agency you have and the stronger you feel as a person. And that's God's will for you to mature and live a fully adult functioning life, whether you're a, a man or a woman. And sometimes, again, Christian teaching for women has been bereft in bringing us up into full adulthood. We've stayed in adolescence wanting someone to take care of us and still wanting to play house, right? And we have to learn to take care of ourselves and still be married and in functioning relationships with people, but capable, capable of taking care of ourselves in every way, financially, spiritually, 
mentally, emotionally. And that doesn't mean we don't connect with others, but we don't depend on others to take care of us as we did when we were children or we're still children, right? All right, let me just see if there's any other questions. Oops, there's two more, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, my glasses are giving me such a hard time. I got new contacts and I think the contacts aren't, wor aren't working right or something. Um, it is not okay to be intimate when separated. My soon to be ex is using scripture to try to get me have intimate relations and I don't want to. He is saying I'm going against Jesus because what the Bible says is allowed in time of prayer or fasting, but that's all. Well, if he's a soon to be ex <laughs> and he's claiming that you still owe him, uh, understand that there's a reason that he's a soon to be ex and he's not respecting your no. So whether he agrees with you spiritually or not, he should respect your no, right? So if, if someone says, I think you should take communion, and I say, no, I'm, I'm not feeling in the right space today to take communion, they're not going to force me to take communion or guilt trip me to take communion. If I don't think I should take communion, I might be right, I might be wrong, but I'm not taking it, right? So if you don't feel safe, and loved to be in a sexually intimate relationship, which is the two requirements God calls for marriage to be that safe and loving relationship in which you can be naked and unashamed. Don't let him use twist scripture to bully you into something to do something you don't want to do. Right. He's manipulating you using scripture to make you feel guilty. See, if Jesus says you better do it, you better do it. And uh, Jesus isn't saying that. All right. If he's assumed to be X, then you don't owe him anything. The marriage is over. It's just not legally uh, declared yet. And the fact that he's still manipulating and trying to control you says it's probably a good reason that he's assumed to be X. Okay. So stay strong and stay no. What if you're fulfilling your wifely and motherly duties to the best of your abilities, but he continues to say, this is not enough. I've given up my career and he won't support me returning to work even from home because things aren't perfect. I've discussed the need to practice self-control, but he refuses seeing the negativity is uncalled for but he refuses to see the negative is uncalled for. I send him Bible verses, try to plant seeds, lead him to the fountain, but I can't him, make him drink. What do I, can I do? You can get a job. That's what you can do. So here's where, here's where you, you've lost your power. So you're taking your power trying to fix him and he's resisting you and that's not happening. And he, you've given him your power to decide. Can I work? Can I work? That's not your husband's decision. That's your decision. You're an adult person. You get to decide, all right? Can you manage the things? Maybe not up to his expectations, but you're not living for him. Can you do your work as unto the Lord? And so if you can manage and you want to work, and it might be that you work and pay someone to manage the things that he wants managed with money that you earn from working, but you want to work. So some people like to work and it's not about earning a ton more money. It's about getting out of the house and getting fresh air from the kids or all that kind of stuff, not just being a housewife. And so to work, if that's something you want to do or go back to school or go get a career take painting lessons or whatever. I mean, there's finances and all that that you have to talk about. But I think to be able to say to your husband, you don't get to make that decision for me. That's my decision. And I feel like it's time for me to go back to work and I'm going to be looking for a part-time job, right? So how would you like to divvy out the responsibilities that you feel need to be done? You can do some of them. We can pay someone to do some of them if it bothers you, right? And here's where you need to assert your own power to say, I'm going back to work. This would fulfill me. Just like, I mean, it, again, if you're saying, ladies, that he won't let me, you've given up your power. And I'm not saying power over him. I'm saying power over you. You can't overpower him. Obviously, you can't get him to do anything you want him to do. You just re re admitted that. It's not about power over him. It's about power over you. And I'm not saying, in a bad way, take self-control. Not self-control and not slapping him across the face when he's aggravating you, but self-control and, hey, this is what I feel called to do. When I felt called to write a book, you know, I was grateful that my husband said, you know, go for it. But had he said, oh, that's going to disrupt our family routine, I would have said, probably, you're right. How can we make that work? Because it did upset our family routine. It did create a little chaos. I wasn't available like I was available when I was writing, when I was, wasn't writing books, because when writing books takes a long time and it takes a lot of energy and time to do it. So if your husband isn't supportive of your goals or your dreams or your needs, I would say, I, I would say a couple things to him. One is it's not all about your needs. What about my needs? Does that matter? No, it doesn't matter. So now you're getting more of his heart. 
The only person in this marriage that matters is me. And you're supposed to support me and what I need. And you're not doing it as perfectly as I'd like you to. So get going, girl. And that's his attitude. So here's the question that you have to ask yourself as an adult woman who's a believer. Is God calling me to collude with that mindset and enable it to even get bigger? Or is God calling me to say, husband, <laughs> you're not thinking straight. Marriage isn't all about you. Marriage isn't just for you. Marriage is a mutual relationship. And if you're not going to stick up for me, I'm going to stick up for me and say, I matter too. And what I need and what I feel and what I want matters too. And if you're not going to care about that, I'm going to care about that. And I'm going to get a job or I'm going to go to the doctor or I'm going to, you know, do have friends or whatever it is that he's trying to tell you you can't do. I hope this makes sense. And this is a lot of what we learn in Conquers. Why have you given up your voice? He may have tried to squash it, but you've let that happen. So take back your power, your decision-making power. God in, in Adam and Eve, he said, I want you to obey me. You decide. They had, the deci they had to decide. Love is never forced. And so I would just have some come to Jesus moments with your husband about, hey, I have, and here, I'm going to give you a, a way to do this. So, and then I'm going to go. Okay. So what if you said to him this, honey, I have a problem I'd like to talk to you about. We talk a lot about this in Conquer, how to say things. Okay. So what if you said something like this, honey, I have a problem. Because if you say you have a problem, you're controlling, he's not going to listen to you. So if you said, I have a problem that I need to talk to you, I, have, I actually have to confess something. And he's going to get all worked up like, oh my gosh, she had an affair. So he's going to, he's going to be all ears. When would be a good time? Tonight? Okay, I'd like you to give me at least 30 minutes, if not more. Okay, what, what, what do you want to tell me? Now, he's going to feel a little anxious, so he's going to be anxious to hear you. So my problem with you is I haven't been honest. <laughs> so he's going to make up a story in his head. Oh, my gosh, like who she, who she, who she with? Who she cheating? Or what she spend or whatever? You know, what did you do bad? I haven't been honest with you. And I've come to, um, you know, understand that. And I want to talk to you about that. Okay, what? So I thought that to make a good marriage, it was really important for me to revolve my life around you and make you happy in every way. And obviously I failed. Obviously you're still not happy. I still can't revolve my life around you so much so that you're never upset or disappointed with me. You've told me over and over again, you're upset and disappointed with me. You're upset and disappointed with me. I don't do this. I don't do this. I can't do this. I can't do that. So I've decided that that has been an error, that my job is not to revolve my life around you. My job is to revolve my life around Jesus. I've used you as my God, and you've been able to be my God and tell me yes or no or good or bad. And I've let that happen. And I'm not going to let that happen anymore, that that's not your place. You're not my God. You're my husband. And I'd like to have a good relationship with you. But in order to have a good relationship with you, I have to matter too. And I haven't mattered. Not only have I not mattered to you, I haven't mattered to me because I've been so believing that all that mattered was you. But that's not true. And God has shown me that. And so something that matters to me is working and having some time to develop my skills and my abilities and my dreams. And I'm going to be working part-time. I'm going to be looking for a job or full-time, whatever you want to do. And I know you're not going to like it, but I want to be honest with you that even if you don't care about me, I'm going to start to care about me. And maybe you do care about me, but I haven't seen it because all you seem to complain about is how I don't serve you. But I never hear you asking me how you can serve me. And marriage is a partnership. It's not a dictatorship. And I'm going to do what I need to do for me now because I'm going to live for my life for the Lord and not to please you. Something along those lines. But that might help you to kind of have somewhat of an outline of how you can approach things. Like, I'm not doing this dance anymore. I'm not, I'm not doing this enabling dance step anymore where you're the king and I'm the slave. It's not working. And it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Headship doesn't mean he gets that power over you position. That's not what headship means. So I hope you show up tomorrow for our Facebook Live, not reacting, uh, learning how to respond just like that respond, speaking the truth in love, thinking about what you want to say, learning to say it wisely, but strongly and firmly. But you've got to get your own internal muscles strong too, because sometimes someone goes, you get, you know, you get real strong and you say something and they go like, boing, and you, will, <laughs> you just fall right over because you're so nervous about the whole thing. So we want to help equip you 
to invite your husband to change. And I'll tell you one more thing before we go. Um, and I think I said this last yesterday too. Um, I've been doing this for um, full time, working with women in destructive marriages for almost 20 years now. Um, I have to say, there's not a lot of marriages that I know of that have been, um, that have been really, really bad, that have been, husbands have woken up without a woman getting stronger first. So when I speak, and I speak all over the country, um, or before COVID, um, I would have men that came up to me, women, women with their husbands in professional conferences or people who write me emails and stuff and say, thank you, thank you. And the only thank yous I've gotten like that is when a couple's relationship has made it, is when a man has said, and the man comes up to me and he says, thank you for helping my wife get strong enough to say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, I love you, but I'm not doing it this way anymore. And, and actually able to implement that because that's when I learned the ways I used to act aren't going to work and I'm going to lose her. I'm going to lose my marriage and my family if I don't get my act together. And so you're getting strong in a good way invites him to get strong too. Not in a bully strength, in a godly strength. And if you don't get strong and you keep colluding with his idea that I'm entitled to be the king and you're supposed to be happy with being the slave, child, it works for him. I mean, I'd like to be a king once in a while and have everybody do what I want to do and involve their whole life around serving me and my needs. Wouldn't that feel good? <laughs> it's just not reality, right? So don't think that that's your role as the wife. It's not. It's much more risky and redemptive than that. So thanks for listening. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow on the same time. And then Thursday, we're going to be at doing it at 730. And we're talking about the more subtle forms of abuse. What does it look like when it's not so obvious and nobody believes you because they can't see the hole in the wall or the bruise on the eye or hearing the curse words come out of his mouth. And so it's more subtle, but it's still very toxic. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.